Greetings, listeners, and welcome to the podcast of Jewish Ideas, a Torah in Motion podcast. I'm your host, JJ Kimchi. Around the year 1190, a book was published that would change the Jewish world forever. The book was titled Dal Alat Al Ha'irin in its original Arabic and has been translated as Murin Nubuchim in Hebrew or Guide to the Perplexed in English. Its author, Moses Maimonides, perhaps the greatest Jewish thinker of the medieval period, wrote this treatise as a response to the religious quandaries of one of his students. Yet this book soon took on a life of its own and became the most influential work of Jewish philosophy ever written. Its ideas and principles would set the agenda of Jewish theological debate for centuries to come. In every generation since the publication of the guide, scholars have embraced or adapted or rejected the guide, but nobody could afford to ignore it. With me here to discuss the guide today is a world-renowned expert on the topic, Professor Len Goodman. Professor Goodman is the Professor of Philosophy and Andrew W. Mellon Professor in the Humanities at Vanderbilt University. He is both a historian of Jewish philosophy and a practitioner of the subject, having contributed many important ideas to the field. A special mention here, one of my personal favorites is his work God of Abraham, published in 1996, an extraordinary contribution to contemporary Jewish theology. Most importantly for our purpose, he has recently finished a new English translation of Maimonides' Guide, which he wrote along with Philip Lieberman, the first new translation of the guide in over half a century. It will be published early next year, along with a companion volume entitled A Guide to Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed, both from Stanford University Press. Professor Goodman, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the podcast of Jewish Ideas. It's a real pleasure to be here, JJ. So let's jump right into it. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask a more general question um, is, is something that occurred to me recently, which is, why Maimonides? In the sense that Maimonides, his works, his writings have been a, a, an unparalleled focal point for discussion among Jewish scholars for centuries and centuries. Uh, and until this day, people are still writing about Maimonides and discussing his philosophy and discussing his legal works. Uh, and it seems to go on unabated, and uh, there seems to be no end in sight. What was it about Maimonides' writings? What were the qualities that has allowed him to uh, assume uh, such a stature? Well, uh, a couple of things. One, uh, he was a brilliant mind. Uh, another is that he was a very hard worker. A third is that he was a world-class authority in three different domains. Uh, he was a practicing and published physician. He wrote 10 medical works, some of which run into multiple volumes. Uh, he was uh, a, a, a brilliant uh, jurist, and certainly his reputation among those who spend their time studying Talmud uh, is amazing because uh, he was the author of three major uh, halakhic works, uh, uh, including a very distinctive commentary on the Mishnah, a catalog raisonné, as I call it, of the 613 uh, commandments traditionally found in the Torah, in, in the five books of Moses, to be precise. And uh, and then uh, uh, he was the author of a 14-volume work, which uh, really brings order to the uh, vast sea of Talmudic and rabbinic knowledge uh, giving you authoritative pronouncements on halacha. Uh, even people who are critical of that work, and there have been some, uh, make constant reference to it and uh, seek Maimonides' sources, which he didn't know his state, uh, and the arguments behind his reasoning. His motto as a halachist was taken from a line in the Psalms, then shall I be unabashed to scrutinize all thy commandments. So his idea is that all of the commandments, not just the 613 of the of the Chumash, but all of the commandments, rabbinic and uh, biblical, uh, have uh, warrants, have rational grounds. We don't know all of them. He thinks in general terms uh, we can know uh, the grounds for all of them, uh, which involve the uh, improvement of uh, human life in a material sense, the improvement of human character uh, in a moral sense, and the uh, and the advancement of human understanding towards our ultimate goal, which is knowledge of and love of God. And the love has to be informed by knowledge, as he argues. So, so he's a brilliant, a brilliant halachist. Uh, before he. Uh, sets out to 
uh, engage with the philosophical problems posed to uh, serious readers who were loyal to and committed to uh, Jewish tradition, but wanted to square that commitment with their understanding of science and philosophy and the problems, starting out with a, a very evident problem of the people who claimed to be the owners of the idea of philosophy in his time, believed that the world was eternal and not created. So, uh, so there was a challenge right from the beginning, and there were many more that he sought to address in the Guide to the Perplex. And those challenges, the relationship of reason and revelation, the very possibility of revelation, uh, the, uh, the problematic character of, the, of, of God's creation and governance of the world. Think about it, if God is non-physical and the world is physical, how do you connect those two things? Modern philosophers talk about the mind-body problem, which is a small subset of that same uh, issue that you have in uh, doing philosophy in a, in a biblical context. So the problems that he raises, the fact that he's very open and explicit about the problems that he wants to address, uh, give him a stature which makes all subsequent philosophers uh, who are committed to Judaism, who are even interested in Judaism, want to take him very, very seriously. Fascinating. I, so thank you. And th this leads neatly into to what I wanted to, to ask as well, which, again, situating the book a little bit within context was, I was wondering if you could, um, again, situate us in, intellectually and philosophically, meaning what were the currents uh, that were alive during the time that Maimonides was writing his guide? Um, or put otherwise, what works would Maimonides have had on his bookshelf um, which inform the writing of his guide? Well, uh, we, we have some idea of that, partly because he cites them. Uh, he, he's very fair about, about that. Uh, uh, start, out, start out with medicine. Uh, everybody who was serious about medicine in his day uh, needed to know the works of Galen. There are 129 works of Galen wow. that were translated into Arabic. Uh, Galen believed and wrote a book on the subject that uh, a good physician has to know philosophy. And uh, uh, Maimonides was convinced that that was true. Uh, he has a lot of respect for Galen. He's sometimes critical of Galen, but uh, but but that's an important source. And Galen, among other works, um, uh, translated, uh, uh, pub <laughs> sorry, published a, uh, a, a, a summary of, of one of the most important works of Plato. It's called the Timaeus. Plato wrote it when he was about 80. And uh, in it, he he pictures uh, the creation of the world by a, by a generous uh, deity who would not withhold being from lesser uh, beings. Uh, that that uh, Arabic translation of that Greek work of Galen uh, was very important to everyone in Maimonides' time who was serious about philosophy, and uh, and we can see the influence of that there. Uh, among the Muslim philosophers uh, that Maimonides read, uh, Al-Farabi is very important because Al-Farabi had a theory about how prophecy is possible. Uh, I mentioned uh, Revelation in our opening portion of our conversation. Uh, uh, how does how does uh, an infinite and absolute uh, absolutely perfect God communicate with uh, the finite and limited intelligence of a human being? And uh, Maimonides has an idea uh, about that. Uh, he 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 develops that idea from things that uh, Al Farabi said. Uh, Al Farabi died about nine fifty, so he's much earlier than Maimonides, who who died in twelve oh four. Uh, at, at a pretty advanced age for those days. Uh, he was born, by the way, in 1138. Uh, if you read in reference works that he was born in 1135, that's nowadays regarded as a mistake. Uh, but but uh, reading Al-Farabi uh, showed Maimonides how to address the question of how a revelation was possible. Uh, and... Uh, uh, another philosopher of great importance to Maimonides uh, was Avicenna, Ibn Sina in Arabic. Uh, Avicenna uh, was uh, 
like like Maimonides, a physician, a philosopher, uh, uh, very uh, diverse in his interests and his uh, brilliant capabilities. And Avicenna believed that uh, the world depended upon the act of God, although both Avicenna and Al-Farabi thought that it was illogical to believe in creation. They thought that the world was eternal. That's a that's an idea that's going to strike modern readers as a little surprising, but it was considered uh, unphilosophical and irrational to believe that God just up and created the world one day uh, uh, without uh, you know having done anything before then. And Maimonides uh, clearly wants to address that problem in the Guide to the Perplexed. Uh, by the way, we call it the Guide to the Perplexed. Uh, I think that's a little better English than the Guide of the Perplexed. In, so to see, guide to the Perplexed, you're saying? We call it the Guide to the Perplexed. Uh, not a big difference in meaning, but uh, but 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 it is uh, 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 it's important in uh, the new translation that uh, Phil and I did that uh, that we should use idiomatic English, and the Guide to the Perplexed is a little more idiomatic. Than, than to say the God of the Perplex. Um, uh, works on his shelf. Oh, one more is, is a work that I've translated from the Arabic. Uh, it's, uh, it's an ecological fable called The Case of the Animals Versus Man Before the King of the Jinn. Wonderful uh, book written by uh, a group who cloaked their identity under the uh, pseudonym or pen name, uh, The Brethren of Purity. Uh, it's an animal fable. Uh, in the fable, the human beings get sued by the animals. And of course, the, the case is brought before the king of the jinn because jinnies are neither human nor animal. They're supposedly made out of fire and uh, they're supposed to be impartial in this case. Uh, and the uh, uh, one of the key philosophical issues in that uh, fable is the... Uh, is the idea that uh, the, the human beings claim to be superior, the human beings claim to have all kinds of benefits, and the, the animals uh, criticize various professions and ethnicities and so forth for their for their false pride and their and their expectations. But one of the key philosophical issues in the work is the issue between the claim that all things exist exist for humanity's sake and the claim uh, which Maimonides agrees with that all creation, everything that God created, exists for its own sake. This was a bone of contention between Stoics and Neoplatonists in antiquity. The Stoics thought that everything was created for humanity's sake, and there's a is an egregious remark that one of the Stoics made. Why would something so noble as a soul have been given to a pig except to keep the meat fresh? They didn't have refrigeration in those days, so so uh, why else would a pig have a soul? But the but the Neoplatonists, uh, uh, you can document this in a uh, great Neoplatonist named Porphyry, who was from Syria, by the way, uh, wrote a book on abstinence from animal food. He was a, a vegetarian tract, but but one of the chief contentions of that book, where the Stoics are disagreed with by the Neoplatonists, is that uh, all God's creatures exist for their own sake, not just to be useful to us. And Maimonides uh, takes that Neoplatonic position and holds it firmly. And uh, part of his argument is, if you believe that God could do anything then he didn't need to create all the animals and plants that we rely upon for our sustenance. Um, God could have just sustained us on his own without uh, creating all those entities that you regard merely as means of our uh, survival and enjoyment. Uh, and and uh, and therefore, uh, he finds an inconsistency. Uh, uh, this is a good philosophical argument. He finds an inconsistency in the people who think that everything was made for the sake of man. Uh, his great Jewish philosophical predecessor, Saja Gaon, who is uh, uh, another favorite philosopher and a great philologist uh, as well, uh, Saja Gaon really um, was among those who thought 
that all things exist for man's sake and man that he might worship God. And Maimonides says, arguing from scripture and rabbinic texts, look, God doesn't need our worship. He doesn't need anything from us. Uh, if God gave us a law, it was for our own benefit and improvement, not uh, not to uh, make God's day happier. So uh, uh, you can see uh, he will take the line uh, that God made everything for his glory, and he argues, interprets that. He's a brilliant exegete. He interprets that line to mean that God's glory really consists in making things for their own sake, not in making things for his sake. I'm glad you brought up right at the end the Maimonides is an exegete, um, because this is this is something quite unexpected when you open the guide uh, to the perplexed. Um, when you open the guide uh, for the first time and you see that many of the chapters, especially in the first section, um, are almost lexicographical. They are very yes. close, they hew very closely to the biblical text and actually spend a lot of time trying to define very precisely biblical words. Why does he do that? Uh, I'm really glad you asked me that, JJ, because it's something which has been something of a mystery to many readers of the guide. It's very important to Maimonides that we not read the guide casually or hastily or superficially. Uh, I've picked out uh, numerous passages in the guide where he uh, uh, warns against haste and uh, actually speaks of haste in getting into theological questions as uh, uh, very dangerous. Uh, let me tell you what I think he's doing in that lexicon, as you might call it, as, as, as others uh, do call it. Uh, it looks at first as if he's just listing a bunch of words and telling what they mean in different senses. That's a start, uh, but you'll notice, uh, well, let me say another thing. To the casual and hasty reader, and I can point out scholars who make this claim, it looks as if he's refuting anthropomorphism. People who speak that way don't know what a philosophical refutation looks like because there's no argument against anthropomorphism in all those dozens of chapters in part one of the three parts of the guide although he, no at all. although he does presumably my one of these seems he assumes it more than that he sees the the biblical text as a, an authority that if he can get on his side would back up his claim presumably he does he does uh assume that the biblical text is sound uh and and it is authoritative uh, that's a working assumption. Uh, he wants to cement and confirm the loyalty to the Torah that his reader has, not just the one he's writing it for, but uh, he knows that there will be many other readers in the future. And he, he wants those people who are mature in their faith and committed in their loyalty to Judaism, he wants them to uh, to, to see that his position is biblical, but but he's trying to, as I said, to cement uh, their, their, their loyalty and their commitment. But let me point out something to you that you won't see on the first reading. Uh, starting out from the fact that he hasn't argued against anthropomorphism in part one, he gets around to arguing against it later on, um, uh, beyond the lexicon, it's still in part one, but uh, he gets around to making an argument when he makes a very radical claim that God has no attributes and is not subject to predication and should not be described by us. And the people who think that God has attributes are worse than idolaters because they're worshiping an invention of their own imagination and have not really reckoned with the absolute transcendence of God. So the problem he wants to start out with is, okay, if God is that transcendent, how is it that the prophets uh, starting with Moses and working on beyond that, uh, have characterized God and, 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 and used uh, all kinds of anthropomorphic terms, uh, uh, not, not just uh, talking about God's face and God's back, but also God's coming and going and flying out of cloud and so forth. How can, how can all those predications be legitimate? And what Maimonides wants to do and you'll notice if you go back and read that lexicon a second time, 
Uh, every one of the terms he introduces is given using using Saj's philo- philological technique is 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 found in different contexts in different verses to have multiple different senses. Uh, and the senses are always arranged in a hierarchy. You start out with a physical sense, like God sat, and then you 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 have uh, a, a, a a social sense. Um, so uh, when someone is said to rise, it doesn't necessarily mean he mean he got up. It could mean that he uh, uh, rose in rank or stature. Um, all those senses start out with the physical, move to the social, then on to the mental and spiritual. And Maimonides wants you to see that progression. He doesn't call it out, but it's always there. And the point of that progression is that when he does get around to denying that God has any attributes and is not appropriately the subject of any predication in human language, you're pointed in the right direction. All the language that prophets use is forced upon them by the situation that they have to be able to communicate with people. And then he quotes in that regard the uh, the, the rabbinic dictum, uh, the Torah speaks in human language. Well, of course, what other language would it use? But in speaking in human language, the prophets have to use poetry. They have to use imagery. They have to use uh, uh, metaphors and similes. And one of the characteristics of those metaphors and similes, uh, as Maimonides brings out very indirectly, is that they all self-deconstruct. Poetry is always conscious of its own metaphorical character. That self-consciousness is one of the marks of poetry. But in this case, uh, one metaphor will deconstruct another. The use of mixed metaphors, like "for with thee is the fountain of life, of life by thy light do we see light." That's a mixed metaphor, comparing God at once to a a, a spring and to a, a light source like the sun. Uh, what what those metaphors are doing? A mixed metaphor is confessing the inadequacy of its own imagery. It's pointing you in the direction of Yes, God is something special, but more special than you might imagine. And it's pointing you in the direction of understanding that that if the if the bottom of the ladder, he uses Jacob's ladder in this regard, if the bottom of the ladder is anchored on earth and above, above the top of the ladder is where God sits, um, God is in the direction of the least physical and the most intellectual, and Maimonides says if there's anything higher than what's intellectual, as Plotinus believed there was, then um, then, then God is in that direction. So when he finally gets around to telling you that the, um, uh, that the use of predicates about God is inappropriate and that God has no attributes, you won't be up the creek without a paddle because you'll know what direction in which you should look for God, the most transcendent, the most perfect, the most absolute, the most infinitely splendid goodness that there could be. That's the function of a lexicon, and it has the dual effect of guiding the people who are able to profit from that guidance and of leaving behind the people who think, what the hell is he doing here? He's just giving us a dictionary of words. And uh, and 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 it's Maimonides' intent to leave those people behind, because unlike a contemporary textbook writer, he doesn't think he has to lay out all his premises in advance and ask all his questions in advance. He only wants to give guidance to the people who are, yes, perplexed. But why are they perplexed? because they're in a bind between their loyalty and their philosophical understanding. Those who don't have the philosophical understanding are not going to be perplexed. It's all going to look fine to them. They'll just take it the way they hear it. Uh, Regarding the creation of the world, Maimonides quotes something from the Chazal, from the rabbis, to the effect that the act of creation is so sublime 
and so transcendent and so beyond our understanding that the Torah doesn't attempt to explain it. It just lays it out baldly and says, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That's an apologetic remark that the rabbis make about that opening line of the Torah. Why apologetic? Because they're recognizing that whatever problems there are about the reality of creation, the means of creation, how was this done? Is it conceivable that, that, that God would create at a particular time? The world only has a finite age and so forth. All of these issues are left for those who are advanced enough to ponder them. And that's the person for whom Maimonides is writing. But naive, naive readers will just take it at face value. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God created something for nothing. We got that. And we'll go on from there. Fair enough. Good to know I'm among the naive readers. Um, so I wanted to... Uh, You've got to read it more than once. No, uh, uh, it's not an accusation or a charge. The book is meant to be read recursively. You won't get any of it until you've read all of it. Uh, okay, so th th this leads us very nearly to, to what I think is, you know, the main difficulty or issue that has perplexed Maimonides readers now for centuries, which is what is Maimonides trying to communicate with his guide? Because as he himself writes in his introduction, and as you just said now, he doesn't lay it out like a classic philosophical treatise. It doesn't look like Spinoza's ethics or, or anything like it. And, and, and of course, we know, we, know, we, know, we know he knew how to do that from the Mishnah Torah. The Mishnah Torah uh, is no better organized or, or, or you know, a work of, of law in, in any tradition than, than what he did there. Exactly. So Maimonides clearly knew what a philosophical treatise was and how a clear uh, and, say, unambiguous work looks like. Um, so, so, and, but he chooses to write his great philosophical work, the Moran of Uchim, um, not in this manner, but rather in a manner that, as you say, requires requires multiple uh, reads and requires you know a, a, an element of depth or a depth of reading which you know wouldn't be required let's say for the Mishneh Torah. Um, so I guess the question here is twofold. Firstly, you know, why, why exactly did he do this? And he says that he's hiding his true opinions. I mean, firstly, why does he do this? And secondly, what do you think was at the core that he was trying to conceal? What, what is the message that he's hiding? Okay, well, yeah, that's a dual question, as you said. First of all, what is he what is he communicating, and and second of all, uh, what is he holding back? Um, and uh, the answer to those questions has to do with that duality among the possible readers. He wants to communicate, as the Talmud advises in Chagiga, he wants to communicate with the people who are prepared to deal with the kind of questions that he wants to discuss. Those would be people. Uh, the, what it says in Chagiga is, is that uh, the act of creation and the notion of uh, a revelation, which the par paradigm case is uh, uh, the vision of Ezekiel in the opening of uh, his his book. Uh, people who are tuned in, people who have been agonizing about that those problems. Not the naive reader who thinks, okay, in the beginning God created, yeah, fine, we'll go on from there. Uh, but the people, but the people who see, yeah, I, I want to believe that God created the world, but is that really a, a a rational, credible belief? Those are the people who have been pondering those questions and are ready uh, with the merest hint to move on and figure things out and put things together. Uh, as he invites them to do. Those who don't see a problem, who are going to be uh, dogmatic or uh, 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 victims of what in Arabic they call taklid, uh, uh, blind faith. Uh, those, 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 the people with blind faith don't need his book and the, and the people who are dogmatic can't use his book. Uh, 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 and, 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 and there's a middle category of people who are um, impatient. I mentioned earlier, he uses the word tahafut, an Arabic word, very interesting. It's, it's, it's used in the title of a, a famous book by his Muslim predecessor, Al-Ghazali, and it, that title is usually translated 
as the incoherence of the philosophers. But in Latin, it was translated as destructio philosophorum. That means the school of the philosophers, people like Al-Farabi and Avicenna. And, uh, and, and they are, uh, they are people uh, that to have good, when Maimonides uses it, does not mean destruction, but it means headlong haste, destructive haste. And that is what he finds, for example, in Alicia Ben Abuya. He, let me step back a minute and, and remind everybody that the guide opens with the promise that he's going to address two topics which the rabbinic rabbis, the, the rabbinic sages, uh, fenced off from casual inquiry. One is Maaseh Bereshit, which is the biblical account of Genesis, and one is Maaseh Merkava, which is Ezekiel's ca- account of his vision of, of God seemingly sitting on a throne, uh, uh, something very embarrassing to the rabbis because we're not supposed to picture God. Uh, 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 Genesis carefully avoids picturing God or characterizing his motives at all. And now uh, Ezekiel uh, seems to be saying that he saw God by the, as an exile next to the river Kabbah. Well, both of those problems have to do with the interface between the infinite and the finite, between the non-physical and the physical. How does a non-physical God create? How does a non-physical God communicate? How does an infinite God? The problem of evil is part of that, because the problem of evil is, okay, if God is so infinitely perfect, why are there deficiencies? Why is there disease? Why do people do wicked things and and, and, and slaughter each other and so forth? the problem of evil is part of Mase Merkava, the account of the chariot, because that's just a special case of the more general issue of the interface between the finite and the infinite. Well, in other words, why is the finite finite at all? Why? <laughs> well, we know that God can't create another God. That would be another infinite being. There can't be two infinite beings. That's just logic. But but only a person who has pondered that question is ready to address it. Maimonides' paradigm case of a person who was impatient in the headlong, self-destructive way that he describes was a brilliant Talmudic sage, and you know his name. It's Alicia Ben Abuya. Alicia Ben Abuya. Known as Acher as well. Oh, known as Acher because they didn't even want to mention his name. Uh, he was a brilliant. He was a brilliant exegete, brilliant uh, 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 legal scholar, uh, and he became an apostate. And the story is told that the reason he became an apostate is that there are two commandments for which a reward is mentioned: honoring your father and mother, and shooing away the mother bird when you have to take her eggs. Uh, and uh, the story is that. Uh, Elisha saw a young man climb a tree in deference to his father's wishes to get some eggs, um, uh, shoot away the mother bird just as the Torah requires, and fell down, broke his neck, and died. Uh, And supposedly that event triggered Elisha's becoming an apostate. Well, first of all, the story is just a story. But what the story is pointing to is the fact that Elisha Ben Abuya did not know how to deal with the problem of evil. In other words, he was hasty. Why is why is this young man who's doing just what the Torah said he should do, uh, falling and dying uh, from a, falling from a tree and dying? Uh, if you spend some time and do some thinking, as Maimonides does in part three of the guide, when he addresses the book of Job, you begin to see uh, how an answer would uh, uh, be possible to those questions about finitude, about wrongdoing, about vulnerability and disease and death, all the things that we count as evil. Uh, But Elisha did not have the patience. And part of what Maimonides is trying to prevent 
to get to the very heart of the, the negative side of your question. What's he hiding? Not hiding anything, but he is not trying to drag into theological discussions people who are not ready to engage in those discussions. He wants to leave them behind. He wants them to scratch their heads and say, oh, people say this is an important book, but I don't get it, and move on to something that they're more suited to or more interested in. Uh, but if you are engaged and you have the patience, you will see in his dealing with the story of Job, he says much the same thing about Job. Job, Job, uh, he says, was, a, was described as a good man, but not a wise man. Had he been a wise man, he would have understood what happened to him. And Maimonides quotes Galen on the general promise proposition of why people are vulnerable. Morally vulnerable, but initially physically vulnerable. We get hungry, we, 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 we catch diseases. What Job would have known had he been not just a good man, but a wise man, he would have understood what Galen said. And Maimonides quotes this from Galen, actually chapter and verse, he gives the reference. Uh, Galen said, don't think that a being that's made out of semen and menstrual blood, which is what they thought human beings came from, don't think that a, that a, that a being made from semen and menstrual blood is going to last forever or move forever or glow like the sun. We're all mortal. We're all subject. Uh, we're not gods. Uh, we, we, we face evils, and Maimonides thinks they really are bad things, diseases. And, you know, he's a doctor. He treats diseases. And he, he treats diseases with a variety of medicine that's nowhere near advanced as what we have today, just as what we have today will probably look pretty primitive 100 years from now. But 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 he does the best he can. Uh, we have limitations, and the limitations come from our embodiment, and our embodiment is a gift of God. Our embodiment is a gift of God. If you've got a body and you keep it healthy and you restrain your passions and your appetites uh, and control yourself, the body is a gift of God. And if you don't, then the body becomes what is figuratively represented as the adversary in the book of Job. It's the thing that that, that is fighting and making demands that uh, are ultimately going to be unwholesome and unhelpful to you. Fascinating. So I, I'm going to try and, and characterize your approach because that, that's very interesting. It seems to me you're taking, I think, some, what one might call a relatively conservative approach to the, the possibility of Maimonides' concealment in the guide by saying he's not hiding a specific doctrine as such, that actually if you're a philosophical reader who can read with patience and with the correct um, that's just the correct frame of mind, mind, the correct frame of reference, um, you'll be able to come to, his, to the conclusions that he uh, posits quite plainly once you can read them. In, in other words, it seems that you, you're, you're opposing the possibility that Maimonides is doing something more radical or more undermining in the guide. Well, uh, look, JJ, uh, I don't know whether the word conservative is right or not, but what's lurking in the background here is Leo Strauss's reading. Yes, I... I uh... Uh, it's been very influential. Uh, uh, Leo Strauss wrote the initial essay about Maimonides uh, in uh, 1935, uh, which was then thought to be uh, probably the year of his birth, year of Maimonides' birth, the anniversary of... of uh, of that birth, and and um, he reworked that essay. He republished it pretty much unchanged in the fifties. Um, that essay served a certain political purpose for Leo Strauss. It was a kind of a protest which others of his generation were making, initially against the Nazis and later against the Soviets. Uh, and and uh, uh, I admire Leo Strauss. Uh, I have a I have an essay coming out in a festival for my good friend David Novak, where I quote a page and a half from Leo Strauss's Natural Right and History, uh, uh, inveighing against the uh, the positivism that had infected uh, the social sciences 
uh, in in his day. And he, as a political theorist, uh, wanted to protect. Uh, one, one shouldn't have to talk about uh, prostitution as though it wasn't, as, as, as though there was nothing degrading about it, uh, uh, etc. Uh, this was all part of a literature that was taking place initially in Germany in the 1930s. Mayor Strauss was fortunate enough not to be there when the when the sledgehammer fell. But Maimonides was not hiding his views. If you ask the question, what was the most radical thing that Maimonides had to say? It was not that he relied on Al-Farabi for uh, his theory of prophecy. The most radical thing that Maimonides had to say was his denial that God has any attributes was his assertion that if you believe that God has attributes and make predications about God, describing God as merciful and compassionate, for example, then what you're doing is worse than idolatry because the idol worshiper does not believe that that piece of clay or wood or cast metal to which he bows down and from which he expects intercession was the creator and governor and judge of the world. He believes that it will intercede for him, that a spirit is in it which will intercede for him with that ultimate highest God. Maimonides is following Porphyry there, who rationalizes uh, the uh, the intentions of the idol worshippers. And uh, Maimonides is charitable to those pagans. He doesn't particularly admire their form of religion, and he has quite a bit to say of it about it in in uh, later on in the guide. But the most radical thing that Maimonides had to say was the denial that uh, that God has attributes and the charge that anybody who predicates anthropomorphic or any terms at all of God, rather than sticking with the Tetragrammaton, which merely mentions God's absoluteness is worse than an idol worship or more, more repulsive to God. He uses that anthropomorphic language himself, more, more, more deserving of God's wrath, et cetera, et cetera, than an idol worshiper. That's a radical statement, and he does not conceal it at all. He's very open about it. He probably expects that after wading through the lexicon, most of the chaff has blown itself away, and, and, and uh, people who got bored by that part uh, will not be with him anymore. Uh, he's very forthright uh, in his in his opinions. Um, he's also forthright, by the way, in his uh, rejection of physical resurrection, uh, some something uh, a charge that he had to face later on in life. I, what, one sec more. Um, the the idea that he wants to conceal something and that he means exactly the opposite of what he says uh, is something that Strauss put forward in the 1930s, repeated in the 1950s for reasons involved with the politics of the moment at that time. It is not an idea which uh, should have the abiding and widespread influence that it has had on uh, readers of the guide, uh, including uh, the great Arabist who translated the guide in the 1960s, uh, Shlomo Pinas, who was who was a great Arabist, uh, but not a native speaker of English, and uh, uh, suffered from various other disabilities, which I think the new translation uh, goes beyond. Excellent. Okay, so so firstly, just to finish off, I'm very happy that you said that because I've ha I've been teaching. Uh the last year here at Harvard, a course on the Mishneh Torah, specifically Sefer Hamada. And, and th these questions have come up, the, the extent to which Maimonides conceals more than, he, um, more than he reveals. And of course, I had to bring Strauss in, but uh, you know, to hear your... Um, uh, I, I, I would just say that I, in general, very much agree with your statement. And I think that uh, Professor um, Isidore Twersky, in whose room I teach, um, I would, would, would almost certainly assent to that. Um, I, in, in, and so you, you made a neat segue at the end, and I, I guess it's a good time to ask about your translation, the translation you're doing with uh, Philip Lieberman. Um, and, and again, this is an exciting event because this is, as you say, the first 
translation to happen since the 1960s. The, pre, the translation that occurred, I believe, in the 1960s um, was uh, translated by Shlomo Pinas, uh, as you say, an excellent Arabist and, um, and a scholar of Maimonides. Um, and, the, and that was only, if I'm not mistaken, that was only the second translation into English uh, of all time of the guide, the first one being... That's correct. There was an earlier one in the, in the Victorian period, uh, which is very widely read, uh, mainly because Dover picked it up and uh, published it uh, in my time. Uh, you could buy that, uh, that complete translation in paperback from Dover, which is in the public domain, which is why they, they published it. Uh, uh, Friedlander did it. Uh, you could buy it for about a dollar forty in in your time, presumably. In the nineteen sixties, yes, less so now. And it's not that long ago, but uh, and and that has always consistently outsold uh, the penis translation because it's so much cheaper. However, I can tell you that the Freelander translation, although it has inaccuracies in it, has a couple of strengths. One is the diction of that Victorian period in which it was done uh, fits the guide. We don't use the Victorian English now, but it fits very nicely. There's a vocabulary there, which is which is uh, sort of, uh, you know, it's like Rabbi Sachs, uh, uh, who, who, who knows English literature and, and, and knows how to, uh, how to find the right word. Uh, the other thing, however, is that Wendover did that one volume paperback. They took the three volumes of Friedlander's translation and stripped out the notes. Oh, I see. The notes, yeah. Most people don't even know it was ever there. Yeah, you can, you can, you can still find it. I, I, I own it, and it's, 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 it's actually got some good insights in it, which are all credited in our, in our commentary. Um, the notes are the best part of that book, but in order to make it fit it all in one volume, uh, uh, they, uh, they stripped out the notes and, and shortchanged. The people who were paying the dollar forty. That's most unfortunate. <laughs> anyway, I, I just wanted to say the question. The question part was why a new translation, and what what is the advantage of yours over the classic uh, Shlomo Penis University of Chicago translation, which is in general use uh, among readers today. It's in wide use. And it's widely respected. Uh, uh, I, I knew I knew Shlomo Penis. Uh, uh, he was very generous toward me when I met him. Uh, uh, gave me copies of all his offerings at the time. We didn't exchange things by computer in those days. Uh, and he was a great Arabist. Uh, I mentioned, number one, he was not a native speaker of English. Number two, there is a convention, uh, which is widespread among translators of Hebrew and Arabic, of trying to tra translate uh, every word the same way every time it appears. Maimonides himself wrote Ibn Tibbon in a letter, who was translating, Ibn Tibbon was translating the guide into Hebrew from Arabic. Maimonides said, don't do that. Don't emulate the sentence structure of the original. Translate for meaning and for sense, not for verbatim echoing. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Ibn Tibbon uh, didn't really do that. He, he was a great Hebraist himself, uh, but but uh, Shlomo Penis's effort to uh, treat every word as though it was a technical term and translate it the same way every time it occurs makes much of his translation unintelligible, literally unintelligible. Uh, if you know Arabic and understand the philosophy that's in play here, you will be able to figure it out and decode it. If you do not know Arabic, and, and uh, I'll give you an example, a simple example. Um, you probably know that the Greek word theoria has as its semantical base the idea of looking. Pythagoras is supposed to have said, uh, some people come to the games to compete and some people come to hawk their wares, but the best people come to watch. And the word he uses there is theoria. And that's important because that's the basis of the English word theory. Now, people who were translating Greek into Arabic tried to do a calc on the Greek word theoria, and uh, and and they they used 
they they used words that mean to see uh allowing the context to carry the weight of the meaning of those words penis does the same thing when he translates that arabic word and it becomes speculative or to speculate i'm sorry i've been translating now since the 1960s and i can tell you that the word that, that in translation in general context rules connotations establish context and in english to speculate means to gamble like on the stock market or something like that or to conjecture to speculate does not mean to engage in theory if you know arabic and you see what's going on uh, that that mistranslation will irritate you but it won't mislead you but if you don't know arabic and why the hell are you reading the guide in translation if you don't know arabic you see what i'm saying you will be misled in translating for etymology and mistaking etymology for being literal and mistaking being literal for being accurate and careful is going to get the reader entirely off base it's as if you were telling people uh, uh, it's as if somebody who didn't know English was looking at the root of a word and couldn't distinguish a hospital from a hospice from a hostel. You see, those are quite important differentiations. Yes. Well, look, I, I, I mean, if you if you say your aunt went into the hospital, that's not the same as she as saying she went into a hospice. The root is the same, but the root doesn't establish the usage. Usage is what establishes meaning, as Ibn Khaldun carefully pointed out in his great work, the Muqaddimah, uh, written in the 14th century. But uh, you see what I'm saying? Uh, you do that You do that systematically, you get the reader off base. And you wind up with a reader who thinks he ought to have this book on his shelf or her shelf and doesn't really have the ability to tell you what's inside. Because the problems are not stated, the premises are not stated, the conclusions are often reached indirectly. And, and so uh, there's, a, there's a further problem that Shlomo Penis labored under, and that is that he got the gig to translate the guide because of the Straussians. Strauss had the idea that he would try and do it himself. Strauss wasn't the Arabist to do it, and they had somebody along there, Ralph Lerner at the University of Chicago, who was helping Penis English his translation, which is legitimate because, you know, if, if I were writing in a foreign language, I would need that kind of help. I wouldn't write in a foreign language because I'm at home in English. But at the same time, Ralph Lerner was policing the translation. And I'm told by people who know that it made penis very uncomfortable because he was making sure that it stayed Straussian. That is unfair to the reader. That, that, that does sound very unfair. To, to your mind, has that prejudiced those who have read the guide? Because that, that's the translation I've used to read the guide. I mean, I've recently switched over to the Hebrew from Tel Aviv University. Um, I don't remember the translator of that one. Uh, Moshe Schwartz. Yeah. Well, he was a, uh, Michael, Michael Schwartz. He was he was a he was a, a wonderful scholar. He died, died too young. Uh, 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 I remember his writing to me uh, uh, a question that really should have been addressed to Harry Wolfson: uh, Who do I think that the Mutakalimuna, the practitioners of uh, Islamic dialectical theology, which which school of the many schools that uh, that Maimonides is addressing, do I think that uh, that the Rambam had in mind, that Maimonides had in mind. Uh, well, he has in mind occasionalists, and it's a synthesis. Maji Fahri, the Christian scholar of Islamic thought, uh, says that the best one, one chunk summary of the Kalam is where Maimonides reduces the doctrines of the Kalam to a few basic premises from which he can derive all the rest. It's a brilliant synthetic work on Maimonides' part, and it reflects the fact that before he was convinced by Al-Farabi that the 
practitioners of Kalam didn't know or care anything about logic, uh, he obviously spent a lot of time studying the Kalam, hoping hoping that uh, that it would work out, and he wound up, as he put it, recoiling violently. He says, my soul recoiled violently from this. Why? He quotes Themistius. Themistius says, we don't build our world around our premises. We build our premises around the world. A paraphrase there. That's not the... Uh, uh, that's... In other words, you, you got to make your ideas conform to the facts. Don't try and make the facts conform to the world, which is what Maimonides accuses the practitioners of Kalam as doing. Let me go back to the question, if I may, about about the about the the the, the kind of influence that you find in. Um, you could see it in the very first few pages of the uh, of the Guide to the Perplexed. Uh, there's a uh, in in part one chapter two there's a long discussion where Maimonides is um, talking about somebody who raised a question about uh, Adam and Eve how come uh, they were given moral knowledge when uh, that's our greatest distinction it sounds like uh, you know putting one of those uh, punishing somebody by making him a star in the heavens uh, he's referring to Orion and myths like that uh, uh, why is why is the gift of moral knowledge uh, a a uh, a punishment and Maimonides Maimonides says that that person was being hasty. He was applying the first idea that popped into his head, and he was not reading the Bible seriously. It's meant to be a guide for every generation, and you have to read it in that sense and in that spirit. And he, uh, but in, in in making his answer to the person who raised that question, Maimonides uh, makes the point that that the uh, he makes a distinction between true and false and good and bad. And Penis, who was living in the heyday of logical positivism, thinks that Maimonides is, um, is saying that there are no facts about values. He thinks that value judgments are subjective and relative and... Uh, uh, even even Rabbi Soloveitchik said this in a uh, in a series of lectures that was actually published before uh, 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 given the lectures were given before uh, Penis did this. They both Soloveitchik and Penis read that distinction that Maimonides makes there as a distinction between fact and value, and dismissing value judgments as subjective and merely emotive and so forth, which was the fashionable thing to say in the heyday of logical positivism. But that doesn't sound convincing at all, at least from my, from my perspective. It's, a, it's totally unconvincing. Maimonides is a moral realist. He, goes, he, he, wrote, he wrote books about virtue ethics uh, in the eight chapters in particular. Uh, no, it's not convincing at all, but, but, but it, it doesn't seem to them to make sense. If you read the passage more carefully, you'll find that the serpent, which of course speaks with forked tongue, was equivocating on the word Elohim. When when the serpent tells Adam and Eve that they will be, or tells Eve that... Yeah, that they will be like gods. Why would they be like gods? Maimonides makes the point that the word Elohim can also mean judges. What's he getting at there? He's getting at the fact that... The, the negative, the, the, the part of the serpent's promise, was, which was a lie, was that they would be like gods. The part which was true was that they would think themselves to be arbiters of moral good. Maimonides goes back to the rabbis. When I say the rabbis, I always mean chazal. And Maimonides goes, goes back to the rabbis who say that Adam and Eve were created with the full complement of human understanding. And Maimonides underscores that by pointing out that 
if they didn't have moral intelligence, they wouldn't have been subject to commands. And yet God told them right at the beginning, you can eat this tree and not that tree. Uh, so they were subject to commands, uh, which is to say they had moral knowledge from the start. The story is not how moral knowledge was given and why that's paradoxical and so forth. The story is uh, uh, representing, in dramatic terms, the natural tendency that we humans have to treat our appetites and our passions and our human conventions as though they were adequate moral guidance. We make ourselves arbiters. It's a kind of Nietzschean point. We make ourselves arbiters of right and wrong. And in so doing, we are putting ourselves on the level of beasts because beasts follow their appetites and passions. And that's why the appropriate punishment is that they had to eat thorns and thistles and so forth. Uh, Maimonides' point is a very clear one. Penis was projecting uh, what was a fashionable story going on in philosophy at that time that he was doing that work, which would be in the late 50s when he got started, because the book is published in 62, I think it is. But, but you know, it took him some years to do it. Uh, I'll give you one more example. Um, there's a... Uh, even before the first chapter, Maimonides is talking about, he has a passage which echoes the kind of thing that Avicenna says about religious experience, which is like a, it's like a, a flash of light, like lightning in the night. And he says, for some people that, Maimonides says, for some people that, that lightning flashes so frequently that it, the whole, the whole night seems to be day. Um, and, uh, uh, he, he ascribes that position to Moses, to Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, and and he, he says, uh, uh, of course, some people never have that experience, never, never have that flash of light, but there are some brightly polished stones that might uh, 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 reflect it for them. Now, the brightly polished stones are prophets, who have that knowledge directly and convey it to others. That's an important role that prophets have because most people don't get that kind of direct uh, acquaintanceship with the absolute, with God. Uh, the word for brightly polished is sakil, Arabic word. Uh, Penis got the idea, projecting what he knew about Kant, that Maimonides is saying that all knowledge has to come from physical things, from bodies. Kant thought that all knowledge was grounded in sensory experience, and uh, and 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 these these brightly polished rocks are uh, are, are the source of that knowledge. Well, I can tell you that that word sakil, which is not a commonly used word is the same word that Ibn Tufail uses to express the notion of human beings who convey knowledge, higher knowledge, mystical, spiritual, theological knowledge to their fellow humans, like light being reflected from a highly polished surface. He uses the same word, sakil, in Arabic. So it could mean the person, not, not just the stone. The person is not a body. The person is the brightly polished, he's, he's the mirror like soul uh, who, who conveys the light that he gets directly and, and, and passes it on indirectly to those who can't have that experience themselves. Well, you know, I'm, I have nothing like the knowledge of Arabic texts that Shlomo Penis had. He had a lifetime invested in those texts. But there's one text I happen to know pretty well, and that's Ibn Tufail, because it was my first book. I did that thing when I was still in my 20s. And I said, wait a minute, I know that word. That's the word that Ibn Tufail uses to describe uh, uh, how, how knowledge is passed on from, from, from a person who has it directly to a person who gets it indirectly. It's got nothing to do with Kant. So what I, I see, I mean, it, it seems that what you're saying from all of this is that you've endeavored to make your translation not dependent on the, um, on the fashions and the fads of philosophy which you know, in in the specific time frame that you're you're writing, you you seek to 
make it as faithful to the medieval spirit in which it was written as possible. I th- I think that's true. Uh, I, 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 one can't ignore the the philosophical tendencies tendencies of one's time, but I can tell you, JJ, when students come to talk to me about a thesis topic, I always tell them, well, the first thing I tell them is the thesis should, a dissertation should have a thesis. You should be arguing something. What a novel idea, Professor. <laughs> yeah, don't don't make your conclusion the same as your premises. Right. I always tell them that. And the other thing I always tell them is don't talk about the issue of the moment. Because if you talk about the issue of the moment, your dissertation will be datable. Oh, that's what they were all doing in 2023. And, and you know, it'll, it'll be a relic of itself before it's two years old. Uh, and yeah, uh, uh, in, in both of those cases, Penis was influenced uh, partly by the bias I described and partly by, by his desire to import uh, some philosophical knowledge that he had, which in, in, in the case of the highly polished object was not relevant uh and and uh uh but i but but if people want to understand the guide certainly you should look at the authors that maimonides read but but look at the argument there's one one thing about context where it really helps to be a philosopher you you, you saw an example of it when i was talking about uh uh you know, what's supposed to be a refutation of anthropomorphism, but there's no argument against anthropomorphism until much later. And then the argument is an argument that God doesn't have attributes. It's not just that he doesn't have human attributes. He doesn't have any attributes. All right? That's the big argument. But, uh, which is an argument in, in behalf of transcendence. But but if you, if you uh, are a philosopher, you'll be looking for the argument and that's very important because if you read the guide closely and carefully, you'll two, you'll see two sentences, very often, two sentences that stand right next to each other and look like they're saying essentially the same thing. And it'll look repetitive. And there's a little particle in there which philosophers are very sensitive to. Some particle which would mean or connote Therefore, and these two sentences are meant to be an argument that the second one is meant to follow from the first. And, and you cannot translate, you cannot translate philosophy if you're not following the argument. What does he think he's proving it? How do you think he's proving it? Let me sum up by saying I'm very much looking forward to reading your translation, your commentary, uh, because as you say, your background in philosophy will hopefully, um, you know, enable readers like me to follow closely the arguments um, that one appears to be saying. I, I I think you'll be able to do that, and in many cases, uh, there's there's a there's a little uh, tick that Maimonides has. Sometimes at the end of a chapter, a chapter, he'll say Arabic words to the equivalent of "Get this," or "I want you to understand this," or uh, "Really take this to heart." Or, Different, different phrases he uses, different ways of translating them. But when he says that, he's always hinting that there's a further conclusion that he wants you to draw. And one of the things we tried to do in the commentary, the, the, the notes in this book are very extensive. They're, 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 they're often uh, as, as big as the text itself. Uh, we try to spell out, okay, what's the further point he's hinting at here? Because he does, it is it is indirect. It is for the reasons that I said, not because he's concealing something, but because he doesn't want to get people in over their heads. Okay, I the truth is we we've sort of exhausted the time that we have, and it's very unfortunate because I've barely exhausted half the questions I wanted to ask. Um, I wanted to ask what I want to ask one final point though, um, which is more present oriented, which it goes as follows, and this is something I've been thinking about for a while, which is that to what extent is a book like the Guide of the Perplexed, Guide to the Perplexed, um, helpful helpful to, to, to religious seekers today? Um, in other words, you know, students and, and readers today, intelligent people, have all sorts of questions concerning uh, religion and reason or, or science or whatever it is. 
Um, and they are often directed to, among other books, Maimonides' Guide to the Perplexed. Now, this is, on the one hand, appropriate. It is the, the masterpiece in Jewish history on the subject. But on the other hand, it is very mired in medieval science and medieval metaphysics and uh, you know medieval assumptions about how the world works and how God even, works. Even medieval medicine. Yes, and, and, oh, absolutely. Medieval medicine, uh, for sure. Um, so, so therefore, my question is, you know, we could say that the guide is worth reading because it is a wonderful historical work. I mean, it is an important, it was once an extremely important work. Do you believe the guide to the perplexed to still be useful for a religiously curious um, seeker of truth today? Yes. And uh, I, I will tell you, since I know we have a little time left, that, uh, that I think um, I, 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 I've addressed that question in, in the companion volume that I, uh, that I'm putting out simultaneously with this one, uh, uh, and and obviously we we don't have a geocentric world anymore, and that's a good thing. Um, the the people in Maimonides' time, and he's among them, uh, uh, thought uh, that the uh, apparently retrograde motion of the planets was the big problem of astronomy, and everybody, including Maimonides, tried to solve it. Maimonides came up with a brilliant uh, uh, way of bypassing the problem by saying. Uh, that 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 uh, this is what they call uh, uh, instrumentalism in philosophy of science. That that Ptolemaic system is is very good for predicting uh, when eclipses will happen, right down to the minute. But uh, but it's not really a model of the uh, of the of the cosmos because the uh, the physics doesn't work, and you'd have spheres bumping into each other and all kinds of bad things. Uh, and everybody was sort of breaking their head over that. Issue because they knew they knew it didn't add up. Uh, Avero he said he thought he would solve it when he was a young man, and now he's an old man, and uh, he hopes maybe somebody will follow it. Well, it, 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 until you got rid of geocentrism, you couldn't. Okay, but the idea, the idea that divine causality is not just a matter of mechanical causation, that's eternal. The problem of evil is a problem we still grapple with. And what Maimonides, has, what Maimonides has to say about it is still germane. The problem of the possibility of revelation. How can we know God and how can God know us? These are perennial problems. Uh, and on problems like that, uh, we, we, do, we do still profit from Maimonides. The method that he's using of taking the text seriously, seriously enough that you're you're not playing games with it and trying to make it mean whatever you want it to mean, but uh, but but seeing uh, levels of depth in that test in that text that's still going on. Uh, there's a thing that Maimonides says near the beginning of the guide. He takes an image from the Book of Proverbs about uh, a gold ball encased in a tracery of silver. He says, he says about that, to the casual observer, it looks like a silver ball, but it contains little islets. And they're called islets, he explains, because you can see through them. And um, if you study and look at it and, and, and pay attention and use your patience to, um, to think, you'll see that the gold is inside there the silver is very precious and that is what he thinks are the the practical commandments of the law of the torah but the gold is even more so because the gold contains the uh the the intellectual and spiritual wealth and depth and richness that uh that you'll find in 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 the torah so uh, one of the things that maimonides can do for the contemporary reader is put you back in touch with the Torah, reading it in a more serious, more committed, more probing, more open-minded, and more patient frame of mind. Uh, that, that, I think, is an enduring contribution of, of the Guide to the Perplexed. Oh, okay, thank you. That's, that's a serious uh, endorsement, and, and I would say a quite compelling argument for its continual relevance to us today. Wow, okay, that was... Exhilarating. Uh, Professor Goodman, I want to thank you for coming on to the podcast of Jewish Ideas today. Um, it was wonderful to have you, and we hope to... Uh, firstly, we're very excited to read uh, 
both the translation and also the the companion uh, to it and also uh, to continue this conversation uh, in a future at a future date really thank you very much this has been the podcast of jewish ideas by torah in motion produced by alicia kelman and myself jj kimchi edited and mixed by alicia kelman you can stay up to date by subscribing in your favorite podcast app to support more thoughtful jewish content like this please visit torahinmotion.org slash donate 